Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe and uh, we have another interview with an author, Kathy Freston, who uh, wrote 72 Reasons to be Vegan, Why Plant-Based, Why Now? She wrote it with uh, Jean Stone and uh, I found it fascinating. I, I read it uh, uh, as part of my trip towards becoming more vegetarian. Uh, I've been on a mission to reduce my consumption of meat and dairy. Uh, basically, I've gotten rid of uh, meat entirely from my breakfasts and lunches every day. But this is a hard habit to kick. And 72 Reasons to Be Vegan explains the benefits of a plant-based diet and also exposes a lot of the unhealthy and often just plain gross truths about the inhumane industrial meat and dairy complex that we rely on for a lot of our food. So I'm pleased to have Kathy on the show. Uh, maybe she can help coach me towards some success. Kathy, welcome. How are you today? Hi, well, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, you know, let me just ask first, can you quantify for folks what the uh, benefit of going vegan is in terms of one's total carbon and water footprint? How much of a difference can just making that change? Oh, it's a huge, it's a huge personal difference. You know, there, there's only so far we can go as individuals with really touching um, the solution on uh, shifting climate change. And what we choose to eat really goes a long way because it's not usually just us uh, cooking. It's, it's we're cooking for our kids, we're cooking for our families, we're cooking for our friends, or we're influencing, you know, community get togethers. So the more that we can move toward um, plant based foods and move away from animal agriculture, the better it is for the uh, environment. I would say, you know, listen, it'd be great if we could all buy a Tesla. <laughs> That's a that's a fantastic thing, but not all of us can afford to get a brand new car and make that switch. And uh, so, so when we so here's the thing about um, about I'm sure you you've talked about it a lot on the um, on your podcast, but climate change. So here's the thing about cows: cows burp and fart. They're ruminants. They chew. They ferment their food, and then the way they're digesting it is they burp and fart. And what comes out is methane. And methane has 28 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. So they're a huge source of methane. And so, you know, researchers from the University of California found that the total greenhouse gas emissions associated with a single burger is equal to driving an 18 wheeler for 143 miles. So you think that that's like, oh, whatever, it's one burger, but that adds up because in our culture, we eat burgers, we eat, you know, all kinds of st- all kinds of meat. And that's, that's really, um, it's affecting the climate change in a huge way. And there was a study out of Loma Linda University that says vegans generate about 42% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than meat eaters. That's pretty amazing. You know, that's, so I think the more people who move away from eating animal foods and toward plant-based foods, the better we are. And, you know, it's not like you have to be full on vegan. I'm, I'm certainly not here to say anyone should eat this way or should be this way. The purpose of this book is to give the reasons, all the inspiring, encouraging reasons why it might be a good idea to consider moving away from eating animals. And climate change is one of them. Certainly well, it's one in my book. And, and the way that book's organized, it's a bunch of short chapters that are just mm-hmm. crystal clear. Uh, and, and, you know, to your point about the burger, here's how I now think of a burger, particularly after reading your book. It's a mouthful of pollution. Oh, I love that. I have to And, and that has literally stopped me from ordering burgers. I love that. Uh, it, but it really came, you know, it came, came clear to me as I was reading your book. Now, uh, the other thing that we, we eat a ton of that is cattle and, and uh, cow based is, is cheese or dairy products. Mm-hmm. Tell us about the effect of dairy products overall in the body. Well, okay. We are, we are drinking the fluid of a lactating mother cow uh, mm-hmm. way into adulthood. And it really makes no sense. If you think about it, we are weaned off of mother's milk usually by a year. 
maybe two years, maybe some people go farther, you know, but let's, let's just say two years. Um, and then we don't continue to drink mother's milk because nature, we don't need that. You know, we've got our growth hormones. We've got all of the stuff supplied to us. We're off and running. But how strange is it that we're eating and drinking that estrogenic fluid from a cow, another species entirely that was designed by nature to um, have a baby calf put on a thousand pounds really quickly. So milk is full of growth hormones. That's what milk is for, for babies to grow little, whether it's baby cow, baby human, whatever it's meant to grow. And Having growth hormones in our body is not healthy because, as you know, if there's cancer cells around there, it fertilizes cancer cells. It certainly, we don't want to put on that kind of weight. We don't want to have, it causes all kinds of inflammation. Um, milk also has tons of saturated fat and cholesterol in it. And saturated fat is also linked to cancer, but certainly uh, both saturated fat and cholesterol are very linked to heart disease. And, you know, that is, that is the problem in this country is heart disease. We are just, you know, in type two diabetes, all of these things lead all of cholesterol, saturated fat leads to all kinds of problems. A very basic problem that, you know, a lot of people don't even think about is that 65% of us are lactose intolerant and lactose intolerance is often misdiagnosed as IBS. Um, right. I have a, uh, yo I had a yoga teacher once who kept canceling sessions and I finally called her. I said, what is, what is going on? Are you okay? And she said, you know, I keep going into the hospital. I have this excruciating pain and the doctors have put me on all kinds of, um, pharmaceuticals for IBS for, you know, all, all kinds of things that are, you know, to stop the pain. They can't figure it out. The next thing is to take out my appendix. And I saw, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, before you start <laughs> letting doctors take out an organ, um, why don't you just try going plant-based for a month? And if you can't go totally plant-based, at least just completely get rid of dairy for a month and see what happens. Within a week, she had no more pain. She never had pain again. She just was lactose intolerant. And so, you know, lactose intolerance can, can make you have a major bloat. It causes inflammation body wide. It, um, you know, watery diarrhea is smelly gas because things are you know fermenting down there. So there's a whole lot of stuff that's wrong with dairy, but you know, more than anything for me, it's just how dairy cows are actually inseminated. I mean, it's not a natural process. You know, I, I know a lot of people say, well, it's natural. It's not natural to drink the milk of another species. We're not even drinking our own mother's milk. But these cows are constantly impregnated with, you know, some guy sticking Even producing arm up her, you know, you know, depositing uh, bull sperm in her. Yeah. And so they keep on producing, obviously, a, um, a a female can't produce milk unless she's constantly impregnated. So she, she's, you know, squeezing out now more than 21,000 pounds of milk a year in, on average, right? So, and it's extremely stressful. She's on concrete, she's got um, machines hooked up to her constantly where a cow would normally live to 20, 25. These cows live to about five. And, um, you know, all of that stress causes a very painful infection called mastitis. And I am sure a lot of, uh, you know, mothers out there know what mastitis feels like, but for a cow, it's extremely painful and um, it can certainly be fatal. But because of this infection, uh, her body is 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 generating um, all this pus, and the yeah. pus is coming out with the milk. Yeah, so they pull them out. yeah, yeah. So we're drinking all these inflammatory cells 
um, of pus mixed in with milk, which is, you know, why it's pasteurized and, and all of that. Otherwise, it would be deadly. So there's a lot of stuff that's wrong with dairy. And it, in these days, it's like there's why even drink dairy? Why even eat cheese? There's so many great alternatives with uh, oat milk and rice milk and, you know, almond cheese and cashew cream and all of that stuff. So there's so many great options to uh, switch out instead of eating dairy. Well, so uh, once again, now I'm thinking of glasses as, as milk as a glass full of, of a lot of terrible stuff. Yeah, I lo- <laughs> love the way you say that. A bite, a mouthful of pollution and a glass full of misery. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Absolutely. That's the right way to describe it. Now, let's, let's talk about fish. Uh, mm-hmm. You point out that almost all fish is contaminated with mercury, plastic, pharmaceuticals here in the Puget Sound area where I live, they have tested fish and they have more antidepressants in them than a human. Mm. Uh, and of course, in raw fish, you have tapeworms. And as a, a sushi fanatic, I, I, I just die thinking about that. Yeah. Now, is a pescatarian diet a bad idea? Is it a bad idea? Did you say? Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's certainly not a great idea knowing that, that pretty much, uh, you know, pretty much, all fish are contaminated now. The ocean is so contaminated. It's not that, you know, you, you think, okay, go out into the deep water, get fish, but it, it because there, it, acid rain comes, moves out over the ocean, drops down, you know, plankton eat these things and the smaller fish eat the, the contaminated plankton and then, uh, you know, uh, up through the bigger and bigger fish. So you're, you are eating a lot of, um, mercury and PCBs and all kinds of, um, you know, contamination, but you're also getting cholesterol and fat. I mean, I know that my mother was just in for heart surgery and it was shocking. Um, in the hospital, they, they give her the heart healthy diet and, and it, it's, uh, chicken and fish. And it's like, okay, well, that might be less saturated fat than a steak, but it's certainly a lot more saturated fat and 100% more cholesterol than eating, uh, you know, beans and legumes and tofu and things like that. So yeah, you're still ingesting a lot of trouble when you're eating fish. And I know you care so much about the environment so, you know, the World Wildlife Federation said that oceans could be empty of fish by 2048. I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a devastating problem because, um, you know, fish are part of the whole ecological system. We, we depend on uh, other species feeding on fish. So, you know, 70% of fish <clears throat> are in crisis already. That's a real problem. So I think that you know, the way we have gone about harvesting fish is, is put us in this position. So I think it's a bad idea for, for a bunch of reasons. You also uh, point out that farming fish is not necessarily going to help preserve cool. the environment as you were, as you were just describing. Yeah, it's pretty gnarly. If you've ever seen it up close, um, first of all, most, most farmed fish are fed by wild fish. <laughs> The, the dark irony of that. So, um, so they're fed wild fish. So you're still depleting the oceans. Um, they're basically little factory farms in the water. And when you crowd fish that together that, that closely, there's going to be disease. There's going to be all kinds of problems. So they douse this whole, you know, tank, this aquatic factory farm with, with all kinds of antibiotics and <clears throat> antifungals. And so we're eating that stuff and there's all kinds of sea lice, you know, so it's just a miserable thing. And again, just like in a factory farm, these fish can't do what they're naturally supposed to do, which is swim and explore. And they're in this very closed uh, container until they're big enough to, to reach slaughter weight. And then, um, you know, then they're, then they're killed. And as we have found out recently, I think a lot of people just think, oh, well, fish, they don't feel pain. They're not like, you know, a cow or a chicken, but there, there have been incredible studies of late that show that fish actually have, um, uh, pain receptors and opioid receptors, which means they do feel pain. They do experience, um, uh, pain, therefore they suffer. So if you care about, you know, fish suffering, which, you know, certainly I don't want to see any, anything suffer that doesn't have to suffer. And because there's so many other great options for food, we don't need to. 
I understand back in the day, you know, we, they didn't have choices, but now we have so many choices. So it doesn't make sense to eat fish when we don't have to. Well, you know, the other, your, your co-author um, described himself as a metaholic in the yeah. introduction, and you also talked about <laughs> addiction right. reality. So it was fascinating. The, the study that you cited about uh, from Edinburgh about meat eaters um, treated with uh, drugs to block opiate receptors actually then ate a whole lot less meat because the meat itself is designed or it, it contains elements that interact with our opiate receptors. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it's a big system. We just haven't understood it very well. And now we're getting a good insight. Unfortunately, and they've already destroyed it. So we're, we have yeah. to make this change. Now, what foods do you recommend somebody like me? Because I, I have this palpable craving for meat. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you suggest I eat instead? Well, if you have a palpable um, craving for meat, I would say have meat, but have plant-based meat. So uh, get yourself a Beyond Burger, try some field roast sausage, uh, you know, try some corn, it's Q-U-O-R-N. Yep. Um, there's all kinds of um, great meat alternatives out there. I'm not saying live on this stuff, but they're sure. great transitional foods, you know? And is the theme that they're using, in, uh, I believe it's beyond, is, or maybe it's impossible. But it's it, impossible. It's, it's mm -hmm. impossible for choosing heme, which mm -hmm. is, a, is a a synthesized form of something in our blood or in blood already. Is that a is that something that would offset the, the craving? Uh, probably. It certainly makes, yeah, it makes the impossible meat taste like real meat because it's got a blood taste to it. That's what you're tasting is that irony. Uh, heme is an iron. So plant foods have non-heme iron and um, animal foods have heme iron. So heme iron comes busting into your system whether you need it or not. So you, you get a lot of iron from, from meat. The problem with that is your body's not able to regulate it. So if you have too much iron, it oxidizes, causes free radicals in the body. And you know, that causes all kinds of inflammation and disease. Yeah. Whereas non-heme iron comes from plant foods and the body is able to say, Oh, no, we're good on iron. We don't need any more. And so it goes out of your system. It doesn't just crash into your cells whether you need it or not so it's an amazing thing with plant <laughs> the, the wisdom of this plant-based food you know but yes if you are really craving meat both beyond and impossible are really really good there are healthier versions of meats like hungry planet is one that's just coming out of st louis i believe and uh it is just you know it doesn't have all the fat and the, the saturated fat that that uh, impossible has that makes it taste so juicy, but these things are great transitional foods. You know, I, I know there's a lot of purists out there that say, Oh, I'm only going to eat whole food, plant-based stuff straight from the ground, you know, whole grains, beans, lettuces, vegetables, but a lot of people wouldn't be able to do that. I certainly uh, couldn't have done it. You know, my, when I transitioned, um, and I wouldn't want to. I really like having a burger when I'm out with friends. I really like having some sausage and a scrambled, you know, uh, they're this thing called just eggs. They, they look like eggs. You scramble them, but made from mung beans. So there's all kinds of things that you can really enjoy that taste like meat. Well, and, and we agree. I mean, I think that the, the, the striving for perfection in this is, is actually the best way to fail uh, because you, you reinforce the fact that you didn't succeed in veganism every day yes exactly exactly so it sounds like that's the barrier to some successful transition so being and you describe this nicely veganish really is the right way to, to think about making this this change i think veganish it gives you some room to grow find your way everybody's different everybody has their own journey and then you you, you just f do be as vegan as you can be and veganish is just fine now, one of the there's there's two issues that I want to ask you about. One is is as a vegan, should you be thinking about dietary supplements, or can you get everything through the foods you eat? 
Well, you can't get B12 and B12 is uh, something that happens in the digestive process and it comes from dirt because we used to, you know, we used to eat like things right out of the ground and you know, it had dirt all over it. And so it wasn't a problem. And the way animals eat now, they're still ingesting all kinds of dirt, less so. Um, so you do need to, as a vegan, you need to supplement with B12. But frankly, most adults do not absorb B12 well anyway. So mm-hmm. Pretty much most people should supplement B12, whether you're vegan or not. But that's the only thing you really must do as uh, someone who's going to be vegan. Um, You can get some, if you feel like you want some more omega-3 fatty acids, you can, it come, you know, you get it naturally in flax seeds or walnuts. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can also supplement uh, from algae and algae is where the fish get them anyway. So you're just basically cutting out the middleman and going straight to the algae supplements. So you could do that. And there's um, certainly a multivitamin if you wanted to. Uh, I I don't think we need that stuff. The studies show that, you know, actually when you supplement you, it's not good for you. But um, if for some reason your doctor said you needed something, there's certainly a a plant-based option. So the other question is, how do you identify what vegan foods are actually good for the planet? Because, you know, we know, for instance, that a lot of soy grown in Latin America is uh, grown on deforested land. Uh, And so you're indirectly supporting the destruction of the rainforest when you eat that that soy. Well, I... I would say, I would just say that with soy, the vast majority of soy, the vast, vast majority of soy is grown to feed livestock. Right. So that all, that's not soy being grown for tofu. You know, <laughs> it's like, so when you're, so when you, one is eating meat, they're eating that soy anyway. They're supporting that soy, um, you know, being grown anyway. But yeah. Okay. Go ahead. What was your question for me? Well, uh, what do you look for to identify? good soy versus soy that would be bad. And, and obviously a lot of that soy that is grown to feed animals ends up in us indirectly anyway. Yeah, exactly. If exactly. we stop eating meat, that would reduce that demand. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you look, uh, you know, are you looking at the new soy industry guidance that is, is calling for, you know, labeling domestically grown, uh, mm-hmm. non GMO and so forth. Is that important to you or is, is that uh, relevant uh, for me, I, I always choose organic if I can, but I'm also not, a, a, you know, I'm ish on that as well. If I were out at a Japanese restaurant and there was a tofu dish, I'm not going to know if it's organic or not. And I'm going to have the tofu dish. I'm not going to be, you know, hardcore about it because I think you can only go so far in your life. But yes, when I'm grocery shopping, for sure, I would choose organic because when it says organic, that means it's also non-GMO. So, um, but again, I, I'm all about the ish, you know, I do the best that I can. I may not be perfect, but you know, I put the intention out there and then I, I just lean into it. Well, uh, Kathy, I want to thank you for taking the time to talk us through this because it's, it's, uh, it's such an important topic and, and you've helped me clarify a couple of things in our conversation. Oh, thank you. And you gave me some great talking points, pollution great. And, and, <laughs> with Dr. every bite. I love that. We're glad we can reciprocate. Yes, thank you. (laughs) Well, folks, that was uh, Kathy Freston. She's the co-author of 72 Reasons to be Vegan, Why Plant-Based, Why Now? We'll have a link to the book in the article that goes with this podcast, but we urge you to check it out. It's a great read. Uh, You'll probably go back to it a number of times, as I already have. This is Earth 911 Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe, your host, and we'll be back with another interview soon. In the meantime, let's take care of one another Let's take care of ourselves and all of us take care of the planet. Have a great green day.